three days, but I believe we cannot end the session talking about the future of metals and mining in the energy transition without tackling the realities behind the policy support and government initiatives that are needed to secure the supply of these critical minerals and metals. And with that, I'd like to uh, welcome our very distinguished guests on this panel. Uh, I'd like to start with Muktazar, who we've heard from on day one. He is the head of sustainability from Nickel Industries Limited. I'd also like to welcome Scott, who is the managing director of Blackstone Minerals Limited, which, uh, who we also heard from on the afternoon of day, two, day one. And lastly, Gloria Zhang, uh, director from Resource Connect Asia. Um, I'd like to introduce them on my own, but they would definitely do a better job. And I'd like to get the ball rolling that, together with your brief introduction, kindly tell us how your experiences um, in terms of navigating the policy landscape within the countries that you operate within the region. I, I guess I'll start with Scott. Yes. Thanks, Alan. Uh, yeah, so at Blackstone Minerals, we're looking to develop a vertically integrated nickel mine and refining business in the north of Vietnam. Uh, we've been operating in Vietnam for around five years now. Um, we've previously operated in Canada. And uh, yeah, so we, yeah, we've had a lot of success with the Vietnamese government. It's, uh, it's been a, an interesting journey for us going into what is, I think, one of the most exciting emerging markets in this region, in, in Vietnam. There's a lot of foreign direct investment into that region. And, and the, the policy support we've had from the Vietnam government, but also the Australian government as well. So we've got a really strong relationship with the Australian ambassador. Uh, he's been very supportive of, of our, our push into the region. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a, a really um, exciting time up in uh, the north of Vietnam. Thanks, Scott. Uh, maybe you can go ahead, uh, Muktazar, for Indonesia. Yeah, thank you, Ella. So. Uh, I'm Muhtazar, Head of Sustainability Nickel Industries Limited. We are one of the top 10 largest nickel producers and the largest uh, nickel producers in Australia. So currently we have five operating assets. All of them are located in Indonesia. So we are exposed to a couple of major jurisdictions. I can say the Australia, the country where we are listed, and also Indonesia, the country where we operate. And I think in terms of the government's role, um, especially in the energy transition, I think it's very crucial to our business. So, so the government has uh, provided like a tax relief for the development. And yeah, as I, I know not everyone might agree with this, but uh, Indonesia has launched the resource nationalism policy thing, and it was enacted in uh, 2020. But yeah, I think for, from my point of view, uh, the resource nationalism, it also helped, I think, to, to reduce the carbon emissions related from the nickel production because, you know, like um, in the past, Indonesia export a lot of nickel, nickel ore, I mean, and one third of them is water. But, but now we process it domestically and only export the product. So I think maybe that's for uh, kickoff. Thanks. And finally, Gloria. Thank you for the opportunity to be on the panel. Uh, my name is Gloria Zhang. From my surname, you can see I'm originally from China, uh, Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, also, I worked and lived in Singapore for seven years before moving to Sydney and uh, WA. I live in WA for 20 years. It's a finance and mining industry. It keep me so excited, that opportunity I'm exposed to. And Resource Connect Asia is a platform to serving as a catalyst to promote the global networking and investment opportunity in the region. And obviously, a future-facing commodity bring us this platform for us all together, present our project, explore the opportunity and partnership. In organizing the conference, I'm lucky to work with Stuart McDonald, Warwick, and from North Point Equity, Tribeca, Agnot, and as a team, also a lot of other supporters and sponsors. It's not an easy journey, must admit. What we have these three days goes by really quickly, but the behind the scenes, the work is tremendous. And also help us understand the success, the failure, the struggle they were all going through developing the critical mineral industry. And also by working in China, ASEAN, 
region, I understand the government leadership plays a very important role, the policy, the regulation. There's over 130 countries committed or contemplating committing to the carbon zero policy. For me, that I look at as an industrial revolution, similar to what's happening in the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century. It's got to reshape our life altogether. And obviously, this journey is not going to happen overnight or within the year. It's a long journey. And uh, in ASEAN region, it is, as a whole, is one economic entity. We hope by 2050, it will be the fourth largest economic area in the, in the world following, United, uh, following the EU, following North America and China. However, this region also have a very large labor force. And different to uh, European Union is we have a very different currency. It's not one currency. So this region presenting a lot of opportunity and also exciting cultural experience, see how each country operated. Although ASEAN region presenting its opportunity and the potential, there's also a lot of work each government have to do to bring ourselves uh, carbon zero ready and going through the renewable energy transition. Thank you very much for all the concrete details and uh, of course introducing yourself further. And I'd like to note that even when you are operating in a certain specific jurisdiction such as Vietnam or Indonesia, both Scott and Muktazar already mentioned that uh, the policy support from Australia, for example, has been really helpful in navigating the challenges, I would say, in terms of policy. So I'd like to sort of start with this first theme on how the current global critical minerals policy landscape is, and maybe ask you about your thoughts on how it is shaping the current narrative and I guess related to overall the region. So yeah, maybe I can start with uh, Scott again. Yeah, so I suppose on this theme, it's uh, one of the biggest uh, policy changes in the recent times has been the Inflation Reduction Act. And uh, I've never seen so much capital that's been moved around the world uh, based on a policy. And, and the amount of uh, change that that has brought to our industry has been uh, phenomenal. And uh, we, we saw it firsthand. Uh, we, we are working through a joint venture process at the moment. And as soon as that IRA dropped, it completely changed our, our um, partners' focus. They were completely, uh, I suppose, rattled with their strategy. It threw, it threw a massive change to the way the battery industry is uh, supplied. Uh, we, unfortunately, uh, in Vietnam, don't have a free trade agreement with the US, and that's, that has been a major issue for us. Uh, because of this focus on the IRA. Um, and so particularly uh, those countries that do have the free trade agreement with the US, um, obviously uh, in a much uh, strong advantage to uh, ourselves in, in the Asia region. And uh, yeah, it's, I think it's a good example of what government can do to incentivize capital flows. and. Um, yeah, the amount of capital that has been flowing uh, through that policy is quite amazing and, and I think uh, a good example of, of what uh, we can potentially do in the Asia region uh, with a bit of uh, collaboration. Um, Europe's obviously got its own um, uh, policies as well, but yeah, I think the IRA is a, is a great example of uh, policy uh, moving capital in the right direction. Thanks, Scott. And uh, for Muktazar, for nickel, which is one of the biggest things around um, Indonesia's own policy landscape towards investment, just uh, recently was when Australia added it to its own critical minerals list, given the challenges faced by that particular sector. How would you say that movement affects Indonesia's own sort of policies, um, still within the purview of global critical minerals policies affecting the region? Yeah, I think that's an interesting point of view, and um, of course, I think for, for us who, who operates in Indonesia, but also listed or established in Australia, we try to follow the government regulations uh, from both countries. And yeah, I think uh, perhaps at, at this point, maybe um, the regulations from Indonesian government affects us more uh, because um, yeah, we, we have five operating subsidiaries there, and 
and now I think uh, the, the government want, want to move on from the initial downstreaming policy in Indonesia, um, in which initially the nickel, we, we focus on the class two nickel, but now we, we want to produce the class one nickel and, and to, to make Indonesia becomes a battery hub, I think, in, in the regions. And also, uh, from, from the global perspective, uh, maybe this is not addressing directly your, your questions, but I would also uh, want to, to bring the European battery passport regulations. Because as, as we all know that nickel is an uh, important ingredient to the battery, and, and yeah, for, for a company like us who, who want to enter the European market, then yeah, we, we also consider our carbon footprint. So recently, I think in the LME, uh, there was a discussion about the green premium for nickel, but I think it was not successful. But fr from my point of view, it is something on the horizon and it will come. So yeah, I think the, the policy from the um, Indonesian government as well as the potential markets, uh, I think Scott mentioned about the IRA, but yeah, same, same like Vietnam, Indonesia is uh, ha not having a free trade agreement. So at the moment, I think that's not something that I will discuss further. But for the battery passport, I think for, from nickel industries, it also affects uh, the, the strategic planning of us. And we, we develop the, the new latest technology with lower carbon footprint. So yeah, initially, we focus on the um, pyrometallurgical process. But in the future, we, we want to focus more on the uh, HPAL technology that can generate nickel with lower carbon uh, footprint. So yeah, I think just, just to uh, run up uh, my speech, so I think, um, yeah, again, the, the inclusion of nickel to, to the critical mineral real list, I think, in Australia, uh, at the moment, uh, in my opinion, maybe it doesn't uh, affect us so much. But yeah, of course, um, we, we also try to, uh, to comply and also to meet the regulations from the market that we aim to explore and to penetrate. Thank you very much. Very interesting. And Gloria, I'm sure in your time with uh, preparing, even just for this event, several conversations have uh, been had surrounding critical minerals policies as well. Would you mind sharing a bit on how that went? Sure. I will just firstly talk about during the inaugural conference last year, we are very lucky to have the Australian Minister for Resources and also the Minister for Northern Australia, um, Madam uh, Honorable Madeline King, to come here to deliver the opening speech. And this year, because of parliament hearing, she couldn't be here. But we were very fortunate this morning during breakfast, we have the uh, Australian High Commissioner, um, the Honorary uh, Excellency, the uh, Alex Cox, was here to deliver his speech on behalf of the Australian government. We also, as many companies here from West Australia, we have the WA Trade and Investment and ASEAN Commissioner, have his representative, Eric Tan, and we have the Canadian government. We also have the support of Singapore Tourism Board, Ministry of Industry, and we're also receiving messages from ASEAN Secretariat, uh, government of Mongolia, and government of Vietnam. So this support shows, first of all, government are very quick in act on leadership projecting and sending a message. A lot of the uh, ESG renewable energy, uh, carbon zero, people are still trying to understand what this means to us, how, what this means to my business. And I'm pleased to say when I was sending documents to China, I was told ESG do not need translation. Everyone knows it's a household word. Although China is you know, lots of documents you do, you have to translate. They said, no, you don't need to translate ESG. We all know what it means. That's very comforting to hear. Uh, with, uh, I work a long time in China, rare industry and lithium industry. Many factories I visited, it was such a good standard. Uh, China has been um, exposed to the world that the environmental management has been, has been a problem for many years. And uh, historically, people just mine, do their own mining without a formal approval. And when they finish, just leave the mountain bare as it is. But over the past 10 years, the government really been strict on that from the uh, sterling, uh, the power pal management, water management, since China making the carbon zero commitment by 20, 2050, they also have a, a dual carbon policy. It means carbon reduction, uh, low carbon, carbon zero, even negative carbon. So they're really firm about how they want to do about this. And also the procedure is educational, showing people how it's done. 
And they also invest a lot of money from the government perspective to technology because they have to think about how to improve productivity, reduce cost to promote EV car uh, sales and convert people to use EV car and uh, the consumer market education. That's quite a lot of money and effort the government trying to get the message across. Also helping the company look at the tax deduction tariffs. In, this, in, in Southeast Asia, they also have a very good policy. Uh, the inter-region policy is low tariff or nearly no tariff between the ASEAN countries. That really is a good boost for the companies who are trying to explore this market and see how it actually work. Because from the operational adjustment, for example, if the mine from Australia are operating to uh, fulfill the sustainable ESG standard, when they go into a processing country, it could be China, it could be Southeast Asia, they also have the same stamp. When they put a stamp on, we call it a stamp identity. That means you fulfill the ESG standard. To fulfill that standard wasn't easy because I was talking to a magnet company in China to say, do you know for me to put a stamp on, my supplier, each supplier had to put a stamp down on their product down to a packaging box. So to get that means everyone have the same understanding and uh, uh, understand what is ESG sustainability carbon zero commitment means to the business. That means you really need to have a government work together, the region work together, and the company work together. And there's a lot of dialogue need to carry it out for people to share the understanding. Thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to, I, I guess, highlight ESG, especially within the metals and mining sector, which I believe is a key challenge, not only for the region, but also in general for the industry. Now, zooming in a bit, uh, given that ESG is at the center of all these discussions, I'd like to know um, what would you say around the critical minerals policy and support within ASEAN as a region and within the countries that uh, you have been operating in? Uh, how do governments in the region actually help drive growth within the critical mineral supply chain? Um, I guess we can start in Indonesia now, um, Kazar. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. So I think for, for Indonesia, story is quite long. And like I, I have emphasized in the beginning, so Nikal was a pilot, I could say. Uh, but but yeah, it's, um, it's a bit different, I think, from a critical mineral um, policy. But yeah, the, the, the government call it the door streaming policy. So the idea is what, uh, was to increase the added value within the country. And I think it was initially implemented in 2014, although it was, um, let's say, temporarily suspended in 2017, and then was uh, enacted again, I think, in 2020, because uh, in 2020, we already have like sufficient nickel refinery facilities within the countries. So, so the idea is um, that the government is aware about the word transition towards a cleaner and renewable energy solutions. And they also understand that uh, Indonesia has a lot of potential with nickel. So I think together with Australia, we are the, the world largest reserve for the nickel. And uh, yeah, I think by, by working together in the past uh, five to, to six years, um, using the, the policy that was set up by the government, then uh, Indonesia, I think, was yeah, was able to, to become the largest nickel producers country uh, in the world. So I think we, we produce more than half of the global nickel uh, production. And uh, yeah, I think moving on, um, like, like I said, so if, if we just process the, the nickel, the class two nickel, I think our resource will be uh, depleted. And then now they, they focus on the class one nickel as well. But for us, for, for Nickel Industries Limited, I think we, yeah, we, we are probably not in the position to, to comment or to suggest to the government, but we, we see this as an opportunity for us. So, so we work with our uh, joint venture partners. Um, yeah, we, we, we were part of the largest nickel pro processing hubs in Indonesia. So there are a couple of um, industrial parks, the IMIP and IWIP, I, I believe uh, many people who are in the Nickel value chains already familiar with that, and now we uh, we move on to our next step, uh, which is to to develop the uh, HPAL with the lower carbon in, uh, intensity. So our aim is, I think, aligned with the Australian government uh, target, I think, to achieve net zero by 2050. And yeah, I think uh, just speaking frankly, I think it's a bit 
faster than the Indonesian uh, government commitment because Indonesian government aims to achieve that in 2060. So we have to be a pioneer, I think, in our operations. But nonetheless, I think we, we feel that as a uh, positive motivations and yeah, we we are proud of what we have achieved, I think, so far. So um, we, we received some uh, incentives, I mean, like awards, recognitions from the government, including the green rating in the past two years. and. I think that's also uh, something that hopefully can differentiate us from the, the rest of producers. Thanks. And how is it in Vietnam, Scott? Yeah, so uh, I think our leaders may have been talking to each other um, back about 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, the Vietnam government came out with a very similar policy around uh, downstream uh, facilities and, and, in, in, and I suppose uh, w would say uh, the, the the, the stick instead of the carrot, and the stick being um, a tariff on intermediate products. So in Vietnam at the moment, there's actually a 20% tariff on nickel concentrate. Uh, the, that tariff's even higher for uh, copper. And so it's a similar policy to Indonesia where it's, it's all about downstream processing, adding value in country, and, and we're okay with that because uh, the, we have abundant renewable hydropower. We have an amazing skilled labor force. So it makes sense just to keep the jobs in, in Vietnam. And so very similar to Indonesia. Um, yeah, it's all about that, that downstream processing piece, adding value, uh, upskilling the local people as well. So we're, we're bringing in expertise from Australia. Um, we're bringing in world-class chemical engineering and, and we're, we're upskilling the local people. So we're, we are very much in favour of the downstream policies of the Vietnam government and, uh, and obviously it's, it's done very well in Indonesia as well. So that, I'd say that one's the stick. The carrot that they do have in Vietnam uh, from a policy perspective is very low corporate taxes in the early years of the project. So. We'll, we'll be starting on 0% uh, corporate income tax for the first four years. Uh, the next 10 years, we'll, it'll move to 5%. So uh, the ultimate corporate tax rate is only 20% in Vietnam. So um, any analysts out there, that, that's, uh, that's very helpful for you, MPV, obviously. Um, yeah, not having large tax uh, rates in those early years allows you to pay back your capital quicker and it's, uh, it's a really major incentive of, for us to operate in Vietnam. But what I would say is uh, it's, it's not just the policies, it's the, the access to renewable power, it's the access to uh, gr uh, skilled labour, um, the, the education system in Vietnam. We've, we've just been so impressed with the, the level of skills of the, the geologists, mining engineers, metallurgists coming out of the unis and... Um, and the amount of, of students that we're getting as well. So we, we don't have a labour issue like the West. Uh, we've got so much strong labour coming through those unis and uh, just so impressed with that. And, that, and that's, a, that's probably as, as good an incentive as any is having, having good, strong, skilled labour coming through the, the universities. Thanks. And you've already highlighted this earlier, Gloria, within ASEAN's regional framework of uh, free trade. Now, in this final speed round, I would say, in three to five words, some final thoughts, uh, we've already talked about the benefits that you're currently getting, but if you have a wish list to policymakers around critical minerals policies, what would you want for them to know? I think I'll just follow the, follow the Australian um, foreign investment and government policy in terms of international collaborations, because it's obviously one country's job, it's not one company's job, it's not one government's job and a collaboration between companies because in ASEAN country they're not just the supply chain, you're upstream, I'm downstream. They also have the resource of their own. So with the investment collaboration, labor force collaboration, trade collaboration, that certainly will encourage all parties working together to do the best they can to put the best foot forward. Capacity building is important. Uh, when I was in China, um, is they're using, uh, put a lot of factory out to automation which is so clean, as one of my colleagues say, you can run your finger there, there's no dust. But is that means you're sacking all your staff? No, you upskill them, train them into a machine operator. They actually learn new skills. And that's also across the region as well, how to government invest money on the labor, on your labor force, as well as upskill. 
and uh, also a lot of small business who play a key role in the trade and its industry. And the government's uh, in education and support and tax benefit was certainly helping the small business to do their job. And uh, institutional investors do concern about small business, whether they can keep up the standard. With the education, proper training and investment, I believe we can. Um, and the rest of it, I would say um, anything environmental, upstream, downstream, collaborate, and also the transparency in supply chain which never happened before. That um, the end user can talk to the upstream and everyone making the same commitment. This is so amazing and I look forward to all the great things looking in the coming years. Thank you. And unfortunately, we do not have enough time. And with that, I hope that was really helpful in thinking about the policy side of the equation. And I look forward to the future of the metals and mining sector within the energy transition with you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much to our panel. And Gloria, I think you pretty much summed up the event for us beautifully during your opening remarks today. So I won't go back over that. But it's been a fun three days. And you and yeah. the team have put, put it together. have done a really wonderful job. And I think we're on target, as Stuart McDonald said, to make this a five-year plan to make this a major event on the calendar here. So I think we're well on our way to achieving that. We are. And also, I believe everyone here will have a long follow-up list in the coming months. And that's what we're hoping for. Thank you so much for your participation. Thanks, Laurie. Thank you. All right, team. We are going to give you one last chance to do a little bit more networking because that's what connecting is all about. That's what we want you to do here. It wasn't just, remember at the start I said to you, it wasn't just about listening. It was about getting involved in conversations and the opportunity to catch up with our experts on stage and also out in the exhibition hall. So come and join us. Lynn Partners is very kindly sponsoring our final drinks and afternoon tea this afternoon. And we look forward to seeing you all again in 2025. Thank you.